All right. Hello, my friends of Sophisticated Color. It's time for another training session. This time, another intermediate module from our baselight learning program. And I will cover the next boost operator, boost contrast today. And as usual, please ask questions in the chat or comment below the video. Okay, let's dive into base light. All right, let's have a look at boost contrast. As the name suggests, it's a tool to manage contrast on images, but it does it in a slightly different way than a normal contrast operator. Let's first have a quick look at a simple contrast tool like the one from FilmGrade. When I increase contrast, dark areas get darker and bright areas get brighter, and then the end result is here. we end up with a more contrasty image. So let's compare that to boost contrast. You find it in the spatial insert menu of Baselight, and here it is, boost contrast. So it is a spatial tool. The first big implication of all spatial tools is that you cannot bake them into LUTs. Spatial tools treat pixels differently depending on the surrounding pixels. So boost contrast works more similar to a blur or a sharpen, you can imagine. When you insert the tool, it has one major slider. It's the gain slider. The default position is zero. And if I move the slider to the right, so if I increase the gain, we add contrast to the image. And when we move it to the left into the negative range, then we reduce the contrast on the image. So now I'm adding the contrast here and we can see, yeah, it's adding the contrast, but it looks a little bit different than the result that we did, for example, with film grade contrast. So what does it do exactly differently? Let's have a quick look at this test image here. So this is a ramp with 31 stops of dynamic range. So each of these steps here is exactly one photographic stop. And so we can see these here as uh, these small lines on the waveform. So when I go into um, a classical contrast operator, like now I'm using the one from base grade and I decrease the contrast, we can see that now we're moving all of these lines closer together. So we reduce the distance from one stop to the next stop. So everything, yeah, looks less contrasty, more flat, one could say, etc. And, and when we increase the contrast, then we pull these steps here further apart. Everything as expected so far. So now let's go into boost contrast and see what this one is doing. Now I'm increasing the contrast and what you can see it's not really moving the steps further apart, but it's tilting the steps. So it on so far this step here, for example, it makes the, the left side brighter and then it adds a shading to make the right side darker when I increase the contrast. When I increase it even more, then we can also see it has an effect on the distance of these steps. And when I go to the opposite direction, we can see now these steps are tilted in the opposite direction. If I go into the extended ranges and get, go all the way to the left, and now I need to also open some advanced parameters to um, drive this thing here out. And so we will cover these all in more detail later. We can see that if we go to the extremes, we just take out all of the steps here without really changing on this test image, the distance of each step. So this is a very different behavior than a classical contrast tool. So it adds shading here on contrast edges. So we can imagine the tool more like a sharpening tool with a very large radius. Let's have a look at another image. So here I'm raising the gain and boost contrast. So that gives us a more contrasty look. I would say the image now has a bit more of a three-dimensional look with more depth in the image. And when I activate extended ranges and overdo the effect, we will gain a little bit better understanding of the advanced sliders. 
So one effect that you probably notice now is that when we add a lot of contrast with that tool, the image goes a little bit into a bleach bypass look. So we have a lot of contrast, but the saturation seems a little bit lower than we might expect it on the image. And there is a luma weight slider to control exactly this kind of effect. When we move the luma weight slider all the way to the right to 1.0, and then boost contrast is applied only on the achromatic component of the image. That means basically the, the black and white component of the image and the colors are not processed by the tool. And when we add a lot of contrast only to the black and white component, but the colors stay the same, then it has that effect of feeling desaturated for the amount of contrast in the image. If we go the opposite way into softening, we will also see that when we reduce the sharpness or the contrast a lot, that it feels a little bit overly saturated with the slider all the way to the right. So let's go back into this direction here. And when we move that slider here, the luma weight all the way to the left, then we're processing the tool in RGB. And that means then the ratios of RGB are also changing and it has effect on color. And most prominently, it adds saturation when we add contrast and it reduces saturation when we go into the softening range. So it's very handy to have this effect on the slider. I personally, I prefer to stay here more a little bit on the, on the left side, maybe around 20 to 30% in general. And the default of the tool is the opposite position to stay at 80%. That basically means mostly achromatic effect and a little bit of RGB mixed in. But it's always good to know that you can control this on a shot by shot basis. The second thing is that we might like what the effect is doing on the midtones, maybe here on the front of the car or here on the wall, but it's too strong now for the highlights and for the deepest shadows. So we want to focus the tool a little bit more on the midtones. And this is what we can do with these threshold sliders. There are four threshold sliders, sharpening highlights, sharpening shadows, and highlights and shadows for softening. That means when the gain parameter is positive, only the top two sharpening sliders have an effect. And when the gain value is negative, then only the bottom two sliders have an effect. So don't get confused by that. And with highlights and shadows, we can limit the effect to basically the midtones on the image. So if I'm now lowering the highlights threshold slider for sharpening, we can see that it relaxes the effect here on the highlights and it looks much more pleasant already. And when I want to lower the effect a bit in the shadows, I can raise that shadow threshold for the sharpening here a bit. Like so. And now we can see that strong effect that we added now feels much more relaxed compared to the before with the default values. So to sum it up so far, we can say that the boost contrast tool is like a sharpening tool with a large radius that is focused on the midtones. Another technical detail that I haven't mentioned yet is that boost contrast is not color managed. So when I go into layer zero and change the stack color space of my shot, that is basically the working color space of the current shot to a different working color space, we can see it does not have a dramatic effect because these are all lock working color spaces. But on the waveform, we can see that different working color spaces give slightly different effects. And what does the scale parameter do? The scale modifies basically the, the sharpening radius of the tool. So when I move the scale to a lower value, we can see then the tool gets more and more closer to a classical sharpening tools so with a very small scale. If I bypass before, after, we can see it looks more like a classical sharpening effect. And with the large scale, it has its typical look of more like a local contrast enhancement in this case. Also, the default is a quite large scale value. With the threshold slider, we can reduce the effect below a certain contrast threshold in the image at edges, for example. So when we increase that value, we can see that 
the overall effect of the tool gets lower if I raise it all the way up to the maximum. And then bypass, we can see it barely has an effect and going all the way to the left then has the strongest effect. Personally, I don't touch the threshold slider that often. On this shot, let's raise again the gain value for boost contrast all the way up to 0.5. And we can see it adds a nice effect on the motorcycle and the actress. It makes them pop out a little bit more and gives a little bit more of a depth feeling to the image. But it's definitely now getting, a, again, a little bit too hot here in the highlights, I would say. So in this case, I would also lower the sharpening highlights threshold so it doesn't overcook the highlights here and maybe also gently lift the shadows threshold until we see a small effect there. Yeah, maybe something around here. Now, if I do before after, we can see we have our effect. And as a typical process, I would then also lower the gain value again a little bit later. In general, I have to say, you should be careful with the boost contrast tool. Don't add too much contrast with it. I will go into more detail on that at the end of my presentation in the advanced section. I haven't explained the anamorphic slider so far. To be honest, I, I think I never use it on real shots. This one here adjusts the shape of the sharpening radius. So then the radius is not applied in a circle, but more in an ellipse. So, and if we go all the way here to the right, so let's increase the effect one more time. So now we're doing uh, solely a horizontal effect on the image. And if I fade back here, now it's only a, at 0.0, .0 it's a 100% vertical effect on the image. And so we could use this to correct, for example, for anamorphic lenses, but to be honest, I um, I think it's not really necessary, but maybe you find some examples where this is useful. And then, yeah, please let me know in the comments below the video. Let's move on to the next shot. Here, I also want to add a little bit of boost contrast on the image. So let's do that. Again, I crank it all the way up to 0.5 first. So that's definitely a little bit heavy here in the shadows. So I'm looking to recover a little bit here gently. And my main task here would be to bring out more of the texture of the wall and of the whole scene, which we are currently doing to some effect, but we can do that a little bit stronger. And I do that now by lowering the scale of the effect. So by reducing this value, we can see so now smaller details are getting affected stronger by the tool. So maybe here, something like, yeah, I would say in this range here, seems to resonate much stronger now with that old wall where the kids are sitting. So now again, we have a very strong effect, definitely too much. I would dial that back to a more um, subtle effect for the final image. Maybe something like that. So this is what you can use the scale parameter for. Let's move on to the next example. And now I'm honest with you. Personally, I very, very rarely use boost contrast. And if I use it, typically I only use it in the negative ranges to soften images. So personally, I very rarely use it to add sharpness or contrast or local contrast to images, but it's also more about my personal preference of the looks that I'm doing. I always prefer a more softish um, look on images. And this is what we want to explore in the next examples here, reducing the gain parameter to add some kind of softness to the image. So on this one here, let's go all the way to the left first. And what we should now do is because the default of the soft softening shadow threshold is at 0.5, if we also move that all the way to the left, so now we can see it has now a really strong softening effect on the image. Maybe I zoom in a bit so you can see that better. 
So this is before, after, so really strong effect. Typically, I move the luma weight also then more to the left, so that it reduces also the saturation of the image a little bit. And now what is what is really missing for me in that shot is that uh, the white keys lose a little bit of intensity. So what we could try is just reducing for softening the highlights threshold. So we're not softening the highlights that much. And here we can see, so now suddenly the keys slowly come back to a nicer contrast value, maybe like so. And so now we have a nice softening effect on the image. Again, a little bit too much for my taste, but I always like to drive the gain first, a little bit too strong in either direction, then to find the nice sweet spots for the advanced parameters and then finally dialing it back a little bit to a more gentle, uh, subtle effect. And so this is now the softening on the image. I always compare it a little bit to, uh, to an optical smoke filter that you can put in front of the lens. So when we do it really strong, let's do it a little bit stronger again, we can see it has that softening effect. I think that uh, an optical smoke filter would also go into the same direction. Of course, that tool is not an equivalent replacement of a full um, optical filter, but it's always good to know in which direction the tool is going or when you're talking to DPs so that they have a better understanding of what is going on. Or also if someone used an optical diffusion filter, boost contrast might be a good tool. And this is where I, I think I used it in the past with positive gains to maybe reduce the effect of a diffusion filter when it's not suitable for a given shot or when the shot flow is not matching that one shot is then too soft compared to the surrounding shots. Okay, let's move to the next shot. On this one here, let's let, let the girl come a little bit more down the stairs. So here I want to do the same again. I had a lot of softening, so I go all the way here without extended ranges to the left. We see not so much of an effect so far, but again, let's do the soft shadow threshold. Yeah, so now we get a really strong smoky effect. I would say on the image. And now we're, we're losing a little bit the girl here, I would say, but generally I like that hazy effect here on the surrounding in general. And so now I'll show you one technique that I'm sometimes doing with these kind of uh, diffusion filters. So I'm adding a shape to my boost contrast strip. Let's do a rough circle here and add a little bit of feather. Yeah, maybe something like this. Now And now we're inverting that thing, but now it's looking a little bit too strong. So now we have zero effect here on the girl and 100% of effect on the surround, which is too strong in that example here. So she, it really looks artificial here in the center. But what I often like to do is in that case, now reducing the opacity of the shape, but it's an inverted shape. So now when I reduce the opacity, we also give a little bit of the effect back on the girl. And then often something like doing a little bit inside the shape, but all of it in the surrounding is a nice technique to get an, to a good final result here. Again, I would say the before after probably a little bit too strong, but now if we dial it back to something like 0.3, we can see it might be exactly what we want to do with the look of that scene. And of course we would need to track or keyframe the shape here on the shot when she walks down the stairs, but that's a topic for another session. Let's go to the next shot, this one here. So here we have a camera dolly outside of the room with the jacuzzi. And here I want to add uh, more like a hazy effect that the water, the humidity of the water is in the air and giving that hazy look in the room, similar to the previous one. So I would go to boost contrast again, all the way to the left. And also let's do the shadows all the way to the left. 
Now she feels a little bit overly saturated here, so that's why I would say also the Luma weight should go to the left. That looks better. And now the image gets that super hazy feel with a lot of steam in the air and it feels much more humid now in the room. But when we go back, maybe again the effect is a little bit too strong here, maybe on the outside of the room. But in that case, I would now slowly raise the softening shadows threshold so that we get a little bit of the original shadows back here, just in these very dark areas. And now we, I think we go to a very convincing steamy effect here on the shot. So that's before, after. So now let's move into some more advanced technical topics because there are some things that can go wrong with the boost contrast tool. So what do we have here on that shot, for example? So our working format is HD 1920 1080, but that shot that is coming in is in a wider aspect ratio. Here we can see it's 2880 by 1080. So if I add an input area guide, we can see that this is the active image area that comes into base light. So the black areas here are automatically padded by base light. Now, what would happen if I would strip cache now my input strip here on that shot? So let's see, as I press that small C and let's see what happens. Wow, there's something strange happening on the borders on the image. We get a like a dark glow creeping in there. So what is going on now? The explicit strip cache that I trigger here with the small C icon on a strip always strips in the working format of the scene. So in that case now, it takes the input image, it maps it into the HD image, and then it caches the full HD image with the black borders basically baked in. And these black borders are the worst enemy of spatial tools like Boost Contrast. You can also imagine that if we would blur the image with these black borders as active image area, then the black areas would creep here into the image because the software doesn't understand that this is not an active image area anymore, but that this is just padded with black. So what can we do about that? Luckily for that scenario here, so that we have an image that is not covering the full working format. So we have black padding either on top bottom or left, right. There is a setting in the advanced scene settings. So let's go back to the bad state here. So we have it cached and the boost contrast. We can also see that these black areas, they are introduced by the boost contrast effect here. They are causing these dark shadows creeping in here from the top and bottom because this is basically the, these black areas uh, getting kind of like blurred into the image. So I go into the scene settings and there under general, we have strip caching and there it says cache entire working format area. That means always cache the entire working format as it says. And we can switch that to cache only the active area within the working format. So now what Baselight will do is it will map the image into the HD format, but then it will only cache the active pixels that came in from the input image. So now we can see we have the right effect on the shot. And now if I bypass the strip cache, it does not have an effect on the boost contrast operator. So this is a handy little setting to know about when you're using boost contrast regularly. But what if the input image has black borders baked in? So I move on to the next example. So here I have the same shot twice. It looks almost identical. But this one here has an HD input format. So let's get our input area guide back. So basically here, the source frame contains the black borders here at the bottom and at the top. So this is a transcode that comes from somewhere or could be, I don't know, like a VFX shot with black borders baked in, etc. And this one here is more like a shot coming natively from the camera. So here we don't have the black borders baked into the source image. Okay, so let's add 
boost contrast to that shot. I'm going to a very strong negative effect here again, also lowering the soft shadow threshold. And again, what we can see is it adds a lot of softening on the image. Let's reduce the luma weight, it's looking a little bit too saturated for me. And so now I'm copying that same grade here on the other shot that doesn't contain the black borders. And again, we can see that in an AB comparison that the shot with the black letterboxes baked in has a suboptimal result here at the top and bottom. And this is really hard to overcome because let's say I insert a transform strip on that shot and we scale out the effect here upstream in the stack, we can see it doesn't help in that case. So let's copy that also to the second shot. We still see the difference because the boost contrast tool also considers invisible pixels of the source image outside of our working format, which generally makes sense to consider these pixels to get a smoother and more temporally stable result. But if our source images contain invalid data, such as these black letterboxes, this becomes a kind of a problem. So then my general advice is always try to avoid baking in letterboxes, no matter if they are white or black or whatever, into source images if you want to work with spatial operators. And usually everyone works with spatial operators, does not have to be boost contrast, can also be texture highlight or blurs uh, for keys, etc. So always try to avoid baking in letterboxes in intermediate formats like VFX shots, um, etc. We should only do that for final deliverables where the aspect ratio of the deliverable is locked, for example, Ultra HD, and then we bake in the letterbox as the last step in the delivery process. So what we would need to do in that example here is caching, for example, the transform or the input format, uh, the input layer, then the effect goes away. But, but then we also need to be careful during rendering because then we should may ensure that we don't disable the cache for rendering. Otherwise, we will see these black shadows creeping in again. So it's a really dangerous thing in that case. So if you're dealing with that kind of source footage, better maybe stay away from the boost contrast tool, to be honest. But there's also something else I wanted to show you on that shot here. So let's get rid of that. Let's go to our nicer shot here without the letterboxes baked in. And so now I'm adding boost contrast in a layer here. I can also do that with change operator type, right click, boost contrast. And what I want to do now is direct the viewer's eye a little bit more to the main character here in the frame. So I'm doing that again with the shape. So I'm pressing S to add a shape, adding a small shape here onto the guy. I like to use a very large feather radius. And so now we're boosting up the contrast here in the center for him. Maybe something like this, lowering the highlight sharpening threshold a bit so we don't want to overdo his face. Saturation wise, I think it looks good. And what I always enjoy doing is working on both sides of the shape. So now we added boost contrast for the inside, but let's also reduce the effect on the outside. So now I go to the outside and I lower the gain because I think that's usually a good technique to work on both sides simultaneously of a shape or of a key, etc. So yeah, maybe I could do all the way again. Let's do the soft shadow threshold here also. And then, yeah, maybe let's lower the effect a little bit on the outside. So now I'm bypassing only the outside effect. Yeah, that has a nice softening effect. And so now if we see the net result before, after of the whole layer with both boost contrast tools, we have that really strong effect here.
of directing the eye to the center of the frame. So maybe it's still a little bit obvious, so I might reshape that thing here and add even a little bit more of feather and reduce the boost amount a little bit in the center. So now let's see again before, after. Yeah. So that's also a general technique, not only for boost contrast that I'm often doing in my projects. The last thing I want to show is another warning about things that can go wrong. So let's say you have to deliver to different resolutions or you're grading in one resolution, for example, in HD or 2K on your monitor or projector, but you will render the final result in 4K or Ultra HD. So let's simulate, for example, uh, a 2K projector here during grading. And now I do a second cursor and now we're rendering to 4K scope. And what you will see is when I quickly flip between both cursors, you can see there's a slight difference between both images. And sometimes you will barely notice that with boost contrast. Sometimes it will be stronger than this effect. So it's really hard to predict, but in, in many cases, it's not really noticeable or in most cases, but there are shots where you will definitely see a difference. And this is something that can't be avoided with the boost contrast tool. And so what's the way to deal with these kind of effects? In these cases, what you should do is you should then go into the scene settings and then format and color, and then select process in working format. So this is also a more an advanced setting. What this is basically doing is it is always processing the stack in the working format. So in our case, it will always process all of the operators in HD resolution. And so it would not make sense now to render a 4K version of that timeline. But if our scene would be 4K, then we could render 4K and HD from the same scene. And now if I flip between two cursors, we can see we have identical results. So when you need to deliver different resolutions and you like to use boost contrast regularly, I would recommend considering that option just to be safe. All right, that wraps up what I have prepared for boost contrast. Yeah, <clears throat> there are two more things that I wanted to mention regarding boost contrast. One is that when I mentioned the problem with the baked in letterboxes, this can also be an issue when you're dealing with film scans. So when you have film scans that are basically over scans that show the, 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 the film gate and the perforation, etc., this can also cause problems with uh, boost contrast. So in these cases, be even more careful with the tool. And the second thing is about keyframing the parameters. So my recommendation is only try keyframing the gain parameter. When you will touch, for example, this, the scale slider, you will notice that it will have a non-consistent or non-continuous effect on the image. So there will be some sudden jumps. And so you should never try to keyframe the scale slider during the course um, of a shot. And also with the other advanced uh, sliders, I would be more careful. Yeah, so these are my pieces of advice regarding boost contrast. And so now is a good time for you maybe to start up Baselight and play with it yourself. And I see you for the next one. Bye-bye. <laughs>